I'm Rick O'Shea, the literary curator of the UCD Festival, and I'd like to welcome you to this, the second virtual edition of UCD Festival at Home for 2021. The UCD Festival is unique and award-winning, one where the global UCD community of students, alumni, future students, and also the wider general public join us for free online events. For the second year, we're not on campus, but instead where you are bringing you all of the inspiring, engaging and informative activities of the regular festival here for our digital and worldwide festival audience to enjoy. I'm particularly thrilled to be highlighting the series of UCD Festival at Home Conversations. There are over 20 chats and discussions taking place and with nearly 100 free virtual and engaging events also running across the weekend, there's something for everyone in the family to enjoy. You can stay up to date on the full UCD Festival at Home program at UCD ie slash festival and don't forget you can join the conversation through the chat function on youtube or on twitter using the hashtag ucd festival do get involved thanks for joining us and enjoy the event hello everyone uh welcome to our event today and uh we are here to talk about the 32 i actually uh, have a proof copy here for you a uh, sneak peek at the cover and um the 32 is an anthology uh, which is based on the Common People anthology that Kit Duval conceived and created in the UK. Um, the idea behind it was to showcase working class writers. And to, to do that, her idea was that um, she would get 16 established writers to submit work and then to uh, get 16 brand new writers who had never been published before to sort of piggyback on the success of the um, of the 16 established writers. Uh, the book was uh, funded through Unbound, um, which is a crowdfunding uh, publishing initiative. It's quite a unique uh, way of publishing a book these days. But the, the book uh, was a huge success and um, it toured um, around England and, um, and then and into Ireland. One of the things that came up during that um, uh, tour was when Kit was doing festivals in Ireland was that, um, you know, the, we, people were saying, well, Kit, where's the Irish version of this book? Um, the method that Kit had used to find the new writers was through writer development agencies in the UK. And um, they, and therefore there were, you know, Ireland was basically left out of that. So she was uh, thinking, well, this is a great idea. I'm um, um, quite cheeky. So I had run Kit up and said, Kit, you know, what's going on here? Why aren't, why isn't this available to writers in, in, in Northern Ireland? And she said, well, I've been having, you know, having thoughts about that. Why don't you do it yourself? And of course, <laughs> then that's what you get for opening your mouth, really, you know, so you don't really have anyone to blame but yourself. So um, that's how this came up. So, and um, so we've got 16 amazing writers um, um, who, and I changed the title to um, an anthology of Irish uh, working class voices because I, I also wanted to widen it a little bit and, and, and even ask some um, well-known uh, people from working class backgrounds who people wouldn't necessarily know were from a working class background, but who had succeeded in, um, in, in the publishing industry, um, um, or even, and there's a senator in there, there's playwrights, there's, um, you know, radio presenters, there's a, a the book editor of, editor of the uh, Irish Times. So it was a, um, an interesting combination of people and voices because the idea is that partly around this thing, idea you have to see it to be it. And Certainly when I was younger, I didn't see a lot of examples in the publishing industry and in writing that um, that were obvious where these were working class stories and working class writers. So that's the history of that. And today we're here to talk all about the book and, and we're very lucky to have two of the writers here to um, share some of the, the pieces that are going to be in the anthology and also to talk about um, what working class means to them and how it's impacted on their lives and their writing career. Um, and um, I uh, will start with uh, Lisa McInerney, who is, um, you know, uh, well known, um, not only in Ireland, but in Europe and uh, in the UK, she's won awards, um, uh, she won the Women's Prize for Fiction, she also won the Encore Award for her second novel, and she, and, and Lisa, you won an award in Europe as well for it wasn't from an embassy as well. I'm remembering this off the top of my head. 
There was one, the, the Francophonie Ambassadors Award for the translation of the Glorious Heresies into French, which do not ask me to pronounce because I cannot. And there was one in Italy to the Eduardo Kilgren Award in, in Milan as well for the Italian translation. I can't take credit for that. That's, that's translator's magic for you. Well, I mean, you know, they, they, they're only working from your piece. That's better. I mean, you, it's brilliant, you know, and, uh, and you're uh, now um, got your third part of that trilogy out um, and, and doing lots of festivals around about that. So please do try and catch Lisa um, there and uh, talking about her, her new book. And um, the other writer we have is uh, Michael Nolan, who's based in Belfast. And Michael is a short story writer and he's now working on some memoir as well. He's also the fiction editor of a really excellent magazine here called The Tangerine. And, um, you know, really, I mean, it's um, it's quite quickly established itself as one of the most important magazines um, in Ireland and, in the, and outside of Ireland, people look to it as well uh, in the same way they would look at the Singing Fly for, you know, the best of writing that's coming out of this island. And, um, you know, I think um, Michael's now working on some memoir piece. I remember you were telling me about uh, about West Belfast and you were you were looking at images and during lockdown there, weren't you? Yeah, well, I sort of, I've, I've been wasting most of my PhD looking at um, Google Street View images of West Belfast, um, which has absolutely nothing to do with what I'm supposed to be doing. But uh, yes, I am, I'm writing, I'm writing more about the kind of, uh, about where I'm from and and where I've ended up, sort of thing, like so. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, you know, this is you know where we, where we're from is why we're here today, really, isn't it? I mean, you know, this is the thing. We you know we we were all born in working class families and working class areas, and um, this book, um, like like a sort of sister uh, common people, is basically one of one of the key things about it is that it's about saying that you know we're just not. Not, not one story that everyone tells, you know, working class um, families and uh, communities um, do have differences. And, you know, uh, we, I think we're in danger of um, being excluded from publishing. People think, oh, we have that story. You know, we have that working class novel. We don't really need another one. And I think that's one of the problems that we face when we go into publishing. Um, but also there are similarities too, and that's part of the joy of the book. And I know that Michael sent it, he's going through the book and um, I'm, I'm at least having a chance to, to read through some of the other stories and seeing those similarities. So just going right back, um, Michael, tell us a wee bit about your background um, in Belfast, West Belfast, aren't you a Westie? Uh, you know, you know, I'm a West Day, Paul. Uh, yes, I am. So, because every time I see you, you remind me that I'm from West Belfast. Uh, no, uh, yeah, I grew up on. I suppose I grew up in a on a housing estate, sort of like on the periphery of West Belfast. Actually, is kind of Poglas. Is it's just like far, far, uh, far end of the Falls Road. You would say. Um, grew up there. Yeah, I sort of grew up my. Uh, which was interesting because I was reading uh, Lisa's piece today, um, just before we come on here. Um, I grew up in uh, with a, my two brothers and a single mother in a sort of housing estate in Poglas. And I thought that was basically that. But that's I was interested, like listening to it whenever I was reading Lisa's piece today to see how um, there was so many similarities, I guess, with like my family makeup, the years in a way, um, particularly with regards to like how like my mother, instead of, I know that you got adopted, you were adopted by your grandmother. Mm -hmm. um, whereas my mother uh, was, went the other way and had to get married when she fell pregnant. Um, but she was like 17. So she was like waltz down the aisle with some fella who was like 19. And uh, yeah, they had like two kids by the time they were 19. So um, yeah, that was, but no, yeah. So we, we grew up basically housing state, West Belfast and, and uh yeah, I don't know. I don't know what you have to say about that, really, you know? Well, I mean, just that it is. I mean, I, I would think when you, when I was going to say that, you know, did you find with your education that being in a working class area um, that your schools were affected by your or your class or that there was a kind of connection to that? Because I'll tell you why. We I, we were at an event. I think, Lisa, we, I, may, you might have been at it. We were doing an event for common people. Mm -hmm. And yeah, there was a there were some people from West Belfast, you know, who were really quite cross when I was sharing my experience 
of working class um, schools in, in Ardoin and saying yeah. that's just a Right, the working class schools in West Belfast were amazing, and they, they were seen as sort of like the best in Northern Ireland, and they were high achieving. That's my probably I couldn't come from a completely different story. And I just wonder, what was your experience of education and class? I will see. My, it was similarly well to be fair, because I went to I bought an all boys school in West Belfast, um, secondary school. Um, it actually was a very good. It was a good school. Actually, um, the teachers were very good. The the kind of the thing that's always kind of got me with the way it was organized or the way education happened in that school was like there was a there was a classes were arranged from highest to lowest um and you can and i mean r- regardless of the fact that i came from like a single parent living in a housing state off benefits my mother was also a part-time cleaner for in big houses down below road to sort of get by that there were people from much worse circumstances than me and those people were usually in uh the lower band classes and and they they, i mean they didn't even get to do gcse's really i don't think um and i think that kind of system of like you know that process of elimination happens from like the 11 plus up here i don't know what the equivalent is down south or if they're if they're even as the entrance exams or something isn't it but um yeah well up up here yeah you you have to do the 11 plus and that kind of is the first like sort of point of uh you know Let's get all the kind of one set of uh, demo, like one set of children into one set of schools and the other into another, and it usually falls into the way of most middle class people go to grammar schools, most working class people go to secondaries, um, and it's almost like a postcode uh, sort of arrangement than that. Like, um, so everyone in my school were all from sort of the same area, the same sort of social background, but even within that, there's sort of hierarchies within uh, class backgrounds as well. Um, but I kind of I I was surprised that I got through school to be honest with you. Like I I was um, I wasn't very good at showing up, uh, especially like, <laughs> it was like especially in like fourth and fifth year. I was kind of I was very much one of the kids who weren't wasn't going to stay on, who was going to go and try and do a trade, and then you know and I, I think my attendance was like thirty percent, forty percent in fourth or fifth year, um, and then I think when I sort of started coming towards the end of, or the start of my GCSEs that I, we did like work experience and I did my work experience with my stepdad and he was like a satellite engineer. We like installed RT aerials and sky dishes for a week. And it was fucking hell on earth. Um, <laughs> just like, I was like, I don't want to do this. And, and then also I knew that like a lot of my mates who went to do trades Around that time, we're all just, they're all older than me, you see, and they were all like working 40 hours a week for 50 quid a week, you know? And I was like, uh, and then my two big brothers were painting their deck readers and they were always just like miserable. You know, they were working from like seven, six, seven in the morning. They're getting home at like six, seven at night and two of them exhausted all the time. And I was like, I can't do this, you know? <laughs> and somehow I turned it around. To, <laughs> somehow I got a few GCSEs and was able to stay on and do my A-levels, you know? So it was a fucking stroke of luck, really, like. Um, yeah, and went from there. But, okay, and and Lisa, you um, could you tell us a wee bit about your your background and um, and also just how, was was there an impact on your education? Do you think that there was a link between your class and and what was available to you? Hmm, it, it's it's a different one for me because I'm from a, a small or I grew up in a small rural town, Garton in South County Galway. So it's a different system then there is only one school. So there's not a case of, oh, here's the private school. He's, here's the comprehensive. Here's the school for you're going, if you're going to get a trade. There's none of that. So everybody had to go to the same school. But it's, it's very interesting how quickly the, the, the strata become kind of um, set in stone, really. It is very, very interesting. So, I mean, while I ostensibly mixed with girls who were like so I went to an all girls sec- or primary school and then a mixed secondary school so the, the girls that I had gone to school with when I was quite small um so we would have all ostensibly mixed together and we would have all been in the same classroom doing exactly the same subjects exactly the same teachers but very quickly it was a case of well these girls are the daughters of solicitors and doctors and they all went to France for their holidays and they all they all go horse riding on Saturdays and blah 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 and with the best will in the world, there is no real crossover in terms of 
things that you have in common. So while you might be relatively friendly with these people, they never really become your friends. So very quickly, you kind of clump together with people who have very, I found the same experiences as I did. Then when you move into secondary school, that's really interesting too, because we didn't have the entrance exam that a lot of the schools have. You just went in there and they kind of figured it out and they started streaming you, I think from a couple of years on when you started going to exams. And it is absolutely amazing. Well, it's not when you think about it, but it's, it looks amazing at first Then you see that all the kids from more privileged backgrounds end up in the top stream classes and all the kids from the council estate end up in the bottom stream classes. But when you think about it, it's because the kids from the more privileged backgrounds, they've had access to um, Gaeltacht courses, for example, or grinds or, you know, whatever extracurricular activities there might be that would have helped not just in terms of accessing information and withholding and, you know, holding onto it, but also Mm -hmm. in terms of just confidence and the way you move through the world and what you feel is available to you and what you feel you're entitled to versus the kids who didn't have the extracurricular activities really, didn't go horse riding on Saturday, certainly didn't go to France, certainly didn't go to the Goyal Duck, all of that stuff. And not only that, but found, found themselves held back whether because education wasn't seen, wasn't so prized in their families or, you know, whether they were more interested in getting a trade like you, Michael. And it, it's, it's really quite interesting how even almost without that system being put into place, how, how you kind of cling to it anyway and how you end up classifying yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah I think um, also your, oh, I might ask you actually to um, read now actually your little section because i just remembered that it reveals some similarities in terms of um uh, upbringing in terms of your family dynamic with with the story that uh, michael was saying would it be good would you mind reading a bit of that now because it'll um i think it'll resonate with that yeah i'm very happy to my my little piece of memoir which I've never really written before. It's called Once You Solve the Mystery, the Story Ends. And I'm just going to read from the the very beginning of it. So hopefully we'll see those overlaps you were talking about, Paul. My cousins and I called ourselves detectives. It was meant to be the detectives, but we couldn't spell. Nor did we detect much. We looked for clues, footprints, sweet wrappers, snap twigs, and debated what these clues might mean. Heads full of Enid Blyton whodunits with their casts of plucky, plummy Brits. There were real mysteries in the council estate, but they were of the domestic and sleazy bent. And we were too young to care about what adults got up to in each other's bedrooms or what was lifted from whose garden shed. In fact, we had no interest at all in the bigger picture. We just wanted to look for clues. We wanted orphaned components and no conclusion at all. As part of this clue hunting compulsion, we would organise expeditions into nearby fields. There were eight of my cousins in the one family, though the youngest were too small to come with us. In summer, the Carconian cousins arrived to add to our numbers, and sometimes a friend or a neighbourhood kid was along, as a, allowed to come along as well. And there was me. I was an anomaly, a child for whom cousins were about the closest thing, the only family that felt like definitive family. It was summer and the Carconians had arrived. We were staying at the eight cousins' three-bed terraced house and we were going to explore an abandoned tract over a gully that ran along the bottom of the estate. This modest plan tugged at the heartstrings of the dad of the eight cousins, my aunt's husband, and he decided to give us a real chance to explore. Rather than laugh at us marching a mighty 100 metres into waste ground, he would instead lead us cross-country from my cousin's estate to Cool Park, which is about three and a half kilometres away. I don't have a dad. I have instead two mothers, one biological, who is legally my sister, and the other adoptive, who is biologically my grandmother. This is because when I arrived into the world in the 1980s, not that long ago, children born outside marriage were still legally deemed illegitimate. No one was certain what this archaic sounding term meant in practice, which meant it could mean anything at all. My grandparents had lived through a fair dose of hateful Catholic nonsense. They remembered, for example, when overseas adoption of Irish children was prohibited unless those children were illegitimate. So they did not trust the state with me. My mother was 20 and according to my aunt's anecdotes, had no maternal instinct. 
It was decided that the best thing for both of us would be to promote to promote me to my grandparents' ninth child from my biological position as second grandchild to adopt me into the legitimate family. So instead of a young one who slept through my crying and some feckless, faceless young fella, my parents would be a tradesman and a housewife in their 50s who had loads of experience in this sort of thing. The eighth cousin's dad was much younger than my grandfather. He had loads of experience too, but he had a little more energy. He was open-minded in a way that was pleasing to kids and befuddling to adults. He didn't like his children using the word hate because he thought hate was too powerful a word. He was interested in alternative remedies. Sometimes he talked about auras and naturally we all pretended we could see them. He had a bad habit of playing favourites though we didn't understand that at the time. So one or two of us he believed as being able to see these auras and the others he crossly said were only liars. So imagine this man now, around 30 years of age, striding across fields towards the woods, a whoop of small children with short legs in his wake. It felt like it took hours to reach Cool Park, though of course it must not have. When we had scrambled over enough stone walls to reach the reserve, We trudged as exhausted pilgrims into the walled garden at the middle and collapsed dramatically on the grass. Some 60 seconds later, we were grand again and my cousins ran off to climb trees. Will you come, Dad? They asked. But their father said, no, it would be wise to rest. We had to walk home yet. And this sounded right to me. Being a reader, I knew that expeditions were gruelling and reserves of energy important and possibly we would need some sustenance soon. Though the eight cousin's father had not packed sandwiches and there wasn't a Blyton-esque babbling brook in the vicinity. Besides, I wanted very much to please him. I didn't have a dad. I lived in my own head most of the time. The world was as I made it. So as my cousins ran off, I sat quietly with their father, pretending he was mine. I leave it at that, actually. Thank you. I think, you know, my, my eldest sister... <clears throat> which I which I, I see as a kind of common story. The more stories I read about working class lives is she sort of married to get out of the house because there was like seven of us and she was like our other mum and my mum had two jobs and my, you know, so she was like mum, she, you know, she cooked, she cleaned, she did all that, you know, and I, she just married a young age to get out of the house and then she had a child. That marriage dissolved, of course, because it was based on running away. And, um, you know, and then we, her daughter, grew up as our younger sister um you know so that part of our family and that that when people said to me when i was doing this well what's the difference between irish class irish working class lives and work and, and english working class lives or any other work class and i think one of the things because of that catholicism here um which you didn't have in in in, in england you know i think there was that you know you first of all you don't have not always those large families and also not that sort of you know, oh, you can't say that you're out of wedlock and have the child grow up and uh, as part of, as part of yours. And do you, 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 you know of that kind of family dynamic? I think you were saying similar things at the beginning. It's, of it's, when, when you were saying, when you read in the essay there that it was the 1980s, it like, that was a penny drop moment for me, literally about a week ago when I realized that, the, that, that this happened, like my, mom, my, my mother was married at 17 in 1980. And I was like, that's not that long ago. And for in my head, like I had this conception of this being like fucking the 60s or something, you know, like it just seemed like there's been such a, a, like a, a transitory period from that in the last 10 years, maybe particularly like, but um, it, feel, it felt so remote for me, even though it was only 10 years before I was born. Um, mm. And it's kind of um, that, that that's, and it's funny because I, I actually asked my mom about this a few days ago, and because I, I, I sort of asked like, were you sort of forced into this? Was this like kind of you know something? And she's at first she was like, no, God, no, like this was completely my decision. I was a Catholic. This was like what was seen as being the thing to do, you know. And she was a very like kind of religious person. But then upon like as the conversation progressed, she was kind of like. Although your granny did insist, and you know there was like this kind of like a process of like oh like and then the sort of pressure of the community around that and like how mm. much she came with like the fact that she was pregnant out of wedlock and and how people on the street would treat her 
um, people in the neighborhood or whatever would treat her. So like all these kind of things kind of fed into it almost subconsciously that she, she's, she's, it was only when talking about it that she actually confronted it as for what it was, um, which was kind of, yeah, shocking to me actually in a weird way, but, but also like completely, um, yeah, I, I know, I understand it. Like, you know, there uh, is Michael, such you... a... no, I was just saying that, that there is such a, an intersection or a crossover there between religion and class in Ireland. And maybe this is one thing that kind of marks us apart when we're talking about what mm. working class in Ireland means specifically. Catholicism, in both North and South, has, has very traditionally been seen as something of the, the lower class or the working class. And that was something that was systemically kind of created from the penal laws on. You know, this this kind of thing of, of that being for you and this being for us and we're in the ascendancy and you can stay down here. So the idea of kind of even to this, like till very recently, these systems being upheld almost, almost, almost accidentally by the people who were kind of suffering under them. It's, it's not yeah. surprising to me. It's like in your bones, this, this shit. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. I think when, uh, one thing I noticed when I moved back was, you know, I'd always had it in my head, you know, that, you know, this, this idea of, you know, working class people being poor and, you know, um, uh, it's like, uh, you know, the Catholic working class people, we were the poor and, you know, the Protestants were this kind of rich, you know, lived in these gorgeous big houses, which was also true, in, you know, in terms of the, the, the kind of posh areas of Belfast were predominantly Protestant areas, you know. But when I was working around with my book and going around to um, talk to people, you know, it, I actually found that, you know, the working class experience was exactly the same, you know, that, that, that our lives were completely interchangeable. And, um, you know, and it really made you go back to the beginning and us think about all those kind of workers rallies and how at the beginning, you know, um, you know, workers came together. It was actually the religious leaders that drove wedges mm -hmm. because they didn't that cohesion, you know, so there's a, there's a lot of very, it's very interesting that whole kind of, you know, how, how that's actually played out in, in, in Northern Ireland. But I'm going to swing around the R, Michael, and ask him to ring, uh, read a bit of his, because I'm, I'm really interested in the conversation um, around, you know, the movement between yeah. class or perceived movement um, that you've, you've changed somehow because your circumstances are different or because you offer, you're, you're mixing in a new world, uh, uh, and, and what that means. And I know you're, you're a piece really industry that, um, really beautifully. So would you give us a wee, yeah, yeah. So basically, I'll, I'll do a quick context because I'm going to jump forward a wee bit in, in the piece. So I'm probably going to read like two sections from the middle. Um, but the, it's basically about a funeral that I went to a couple of years ago, um, uh, in the housing state I grew up on, and it was my uh, one of my childhood friends, his mother, who passed away. And um, we hadn't seen each other in about eight years at this point. And it was kind of the first time I'd returned in a few years. And it was after I had like um, started doing a PhD at Queens and all. And I was like knocking around with a different kind of more sort of bougie milieu, I guess. Um, <laughs> so it's called uh, <laughs> To My Shame, fuck's sake. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's called uh, Night at the Wake. Um, let me see. Start is there. During my early 20s, when I first graduated and couldn't get a job, I would often find myself in the company of the people I grew up with. We would sit around a table with a big light on and gurn at each other until we ran out of things to say. Then I would stagger through the afternoon blurrily home. Between these two and three day sessions, I would attend poetry events in town, book launches too. I would hang around the smoking areas of bars with people who spoke about literature like they did about everything else, like they were connoisseurs. It was while being around these people that I began to, that I became conscious of my own working classness in a way that had less to do with the disparity of material wealth than the more refined cultural tastes they seemed to carry around with them almost second naturely. I didn't know much about the music they were into or the art and the cultural references that were alluded to all the time and with more irony than I was capable of keeping up with went completely over my head. This forced me consciously or unconsciously, it's hard to tell, into making certain cultural adjustments. I learned how to alter my behavior, my mode of speaking, my frame of reference even, depending on where I was situated and in whose company at any given time. 
this was during a period of my life when I was profoundly embittered by how little my, my circumstances had changed, even with the level of education I had acquired. Nobody in my family had made it through secondary school. And there was a certain amount of expectation on me as the only one who had to do well for myself in the most material sense of the term. I had no illusions. Accruing actual material wealth was unlikely an outcome in the trade I had chosen, as it was for my brothers in painting and decorating. My conception of making something of myself therefore became equated with some amorphous and deeply misguided idea of accumulating the embodied forms of capital. I would need to succeed in a world that was defined by those who regarded themselves as possessors of legitimate culture, the middle class. The only way I could think to do this was to distance myself from the place where I was from, the people I had grown up with, and set my sights firmly on the only consistent ambition I had had since that first time my ma's best mate, Mary, who I called Auntie Mary, showed me how to type my name on a typewriter. Slowly, painfully, and with more than one wobble along the way, within a year of graduating, I was sentenced to 200 hours of community service, threatened someone to dig in the mouth outside a house party on Tate's Avenue, knocking him unconscious. I worked and saved enough money to move to the other side of the city, which is 20 minutes down the road from where I was from, but may as well have been another world. There I found a place to live, in an area where my university friends lived, where the streets were wide and lined with trees, and settled into a life I'd fantasized about for as long as I'd known that if I didn't stop taking gear and partying and running about with a kind of head cases who seriously considered joining Oglin or Hearn just so they could rob the drug dealers they owed their wages to, I didn't know where I would end up. And then there's a section break and we're in the funeral, or at the wake, sorry. The coffin had been placed in front of the living room window. The blinds were closed and in the floor around the coffin, dozens of mass cards had been arranged neatly from largest to smallest with several framed photographs of Jared's ma smiling happily among them. In the corner of the room, on the armchair at the foot of the open casket, Jared's da stared into the space above the wooden box. He was wearing a red jumper with blue jeans and a pair of black shoes that had creased around the toes. And his hair, which was long and gray and down to his shoulders, was starting to thin. Nobody seemed to notice he was there. He looked very alone. I had a card I'd picked up on the garage on the way. I had scribbled my condolences while the taxi driver waited for me to fork out the 16 quid his meter showed. The stop at the shop had cost me an extra quid, which I was happy enough to have paid now that I could see that the people who had arrived in front of me had come with a card of their own. They handed theirs to George's big sister, Claire, who was standing in the doorway between the living room and the kitchen. She looked tired and agitated. I told her I was sorry for her loss and she ran her hands through her hair. Jared's in the kitchen, she said. The kitchen was brightly lit. Three women who hadn't taken their coats off were squeezed around the table with a bowl of crisps they had cordoned off. I waited as Jared finished what he was doing with the empty can cups he had lined up in front of the boiled kettle. He glanced at me and it was like he had made eye contact with someone he was passing on the street. And then, with the slowness of a paddle sinking to the bottom of a pond, it clicked. Well, Mick, he said. What's happening? It had been eight years since we last saw each other, and of those Jared's face registered surprise. It wasn't the surprise of a person who had assumed we would never see each other again. And it hit me. The debilitating sense of loss that came with comprehending for the first time, the extent to which I closed the book on our friendship, while he, being the one who had not been able to go anywhere, whose existence remained fixed to the place for each of us, in her own way, tried her best to get away from, had merely turned down the corner of the page. Pleased as I was to see him, and touched as he was by the gesture, the fact that I had chosen his mother's death over the innumerable traumas he had suffered long before his 18-month stint in Magabry, which culminated in him being put out of the country by the same man who left him breathing shallowly through a punctured lung one night he was trailed down an alley yards away from his dad's flat, hung like a dead weight over every word we exchanged. It immediately quashed whatever hopes I had of us falling back into step with one another, even just for a few minutes. Our lives had diverged too thoroughly. The distance between our realities was too remote. But we weren't completely foreign to one another, to each other. We saw in ourselves some semblance of who we were when we were kids, and that was enough. I'll leave it there.
Sure. That's Thank you. <laughs> Great story, very powerful stuff. Um, Lisa, what, um, did your idea of yourself and your future when you were younger, when you were growing up, and was it limited by your sense of class or your place in life? Um, or were you able to, did it make you uh, want to strive? I know I read an article of yours today um, about the, an escape plan, for example, of, 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 you know, how to get out of, uh, you know, your, your, your humble feelings, as it were. I mean, you know, so were you, was, I, mean, I know I was always dreaming of escape and things like that, you know, but I was limited to what I thought I could do based on my mm. background and education and um, that was all wrapped up in my class. Yeah, I think it's it's exactly the same for me, Paul. Um, it was a case of the, what was actually possible to me, and it wasn't it wasn't that what was possible to me that was being told to me by others. It was what I had in my head that was possible. I never really had any ambitions for myself whatsoever. It was nothing to do with my family. They were like, I I went to university. I did two years of university, and then I dropped out because I was sick of having no money. Um, my family were very keen on me going to university and very keen on me getting educated, but not like their idea was to get educated in order to, as you were saying there, to have money, to do well for yourself, to do financially well for yourself. So like, I remember my Nana would say things to me like, wouldn't you be great now if you got a job in the bank? Like that would have been nice, respectable and, and kind of solid and a, and a good kind of way to build a life, that kind of thing. So I didn't think that that was going to happen. I knew where my talents uh, lay and it was like in the arts. And I knew that that was, that was a bad sign, you know, that I wasn't going to be an accountant and I wasn't going to be a doctor and I didn't have the brains for that kind of thing. So, but like, I don't know. I mean, it, it's, it's quite interesting, the blocks you put in place yourself. It's almost like a, as a working class child, it's almost like you're very pragmatic very quickly when when maybe you shouldn't be and maybe you should have a, a, a more an idea of the world being completely open to you. Some of my cousins now would have gone on to uh, like literally leave Ireland as a way of kind of breaking out of that thing. Yeah. I couldn't do that. I had I had I had a child <clears throat> at the age of 20, so I was pretty much stuck here. Um, and kind of happily stuck here as well. Like I, 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 I joked that I'm of the, I was of the kind of class where I didn't even have the money to emigrate. Um, and yeah, and, and for a long time, I figured that that was going to be it for me. And I, I, I had it like I was going to stay in a council estate for the rest of my life and stuff. Um, it's a, it's a strange, it's a strange thing. So writing kind of is a way of kind of pulling. I'm not going to say pulling myself out of it because. I don't like to think of it that way either, as if to say that there was something wrong with it in the first place. You feel very bad about suggesting anything of the sort, even though it is like living in council estate is not much crack generally. I mean, like you can have the best neighbors in the world, but there's some, there's something shite will be happening at every moment. It's just a dramatic, dramatic place to live. And do I want to go back to a council estate? No, never. I really, I really don't. And I don't care how many notions um, that that gives me. That's the thing. That's the word notions. You start notions. getting afraid, afraid of having any ambition because it's some betrayal of what you should be or what you should be proud of. It's a strange yeah. thing. Yes. Yes. We, we, I mean, we, we didn't say notions, but we, my, my thing is that he'll be having ideas, which ideas. is, a, you know, like you'll be having, an, having an idea is the wrong thing. Don't be having any idea. Don't mm -hmm. be having an imagination. Do we have an imagine? Because it's like it was saying, I mean, obviously there was this huge pride of being part of a working class, from a working class background and being part of that community. There's a massive chip and a pride that comes there. But it lives alongside, you know, the other, the, the other side, which is if you kind of leave us, you're slight, you're saying that we're not good enough. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. that actually you're saying, you know, this life isn't good. By wanting more, and wanting more can be, you know, wanting to speak in, in, in better English, or you know, <laughs> having a nice job, or wearing certain clothes, or you know, that kind of idea. You've become a snob, or and you know, you've abandoned us. You know, Michael, what was your experience? Did you find that, that your dreams were limited by your education or by your by your class? See, uh, I, I sort of knew when I sort of got to the point where it actually when I got to like 
to do A levels, which was like a big fucking surprise to everybody. It was um, <laughs> any stop cursing, but the uh, it's sort of yes. whenever going to university became like you know an actual option. Um, I I knew that I had to get out of Belfast at least. I had to get out of the north. I had to just go, so I went to Liverpool, sort of thing, like, and that was me sort of trying to escape um, to try and get away. And the reason for it was like, well, I mean, you know, I had friends growing up who um, got into a lot of trouble, like, you know, friends who went to jail and friends who uh, committed suicide, uh, friends who addiction problems, drugs, alcohol, came from real broken families, stealing cars, all that sort of stuff. And I was kind of like, there was a point in my life where I was kind of wavering um, between those, or at least like, I, was, I mean, I was arrested a couple of times when I was about 16, 15. And so there was, there was a couple of things, you know, and, and I, knew, I knew that if it didn't go, that I might, and I, and it's, a, and, I, and I understand, it feels like a betrayal, like, it does like, cause you're going, I need to get the fuck out of here. And, but at the same time, you've got this pool. And mm -hmm. when I came back from Liverpool, all my family were still, you know, so I, when I came home, I, I came straight back to, to where I was before. and um. I guess that's what that essay is kind of trying to touch on is that like it's move. It, I was, I was, there was a stage in my twenties where I was one night I was going to a poetry event in town. And then the next I was like, you know, locking myself in a house in Twinbrook for three days and, you know, doing whatever. And, um, so I, f there was a real kind of worry there that in my head, the back of my head, I was like, I need to, I need to get my act together. And if I don't, I'll, I never will sort of thing. Um, and I guess that like writing and, 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 and going off what Lisa was saying there, the, you don't want to say that writing's the escape or something like that, but that seemed to be like, that was the channel that I needed in order to try and like, you know, and, and it was less to do with material gain that it was just some kind of like, um, I guess it is like a cultural kind of, um, acquisition really in a way, isn't it? But, um, and, and, and in a way where I can just like, go and say and, and, and express yourself or like whatever, you know, be your, be a different person in a way, you know? Um, yeah. I think sometimes you, you do need to like physically get out uh, yeah. in order to sort of program yourself. But also I think writing is a form of sort of internally running away. You yeah. know, it, it, it's the same thing. Um, I think mm -hmm. that we're doing, but we, sometimes it's because you literally physically can't get away. Yeah. So you have to, away in here you know because you can't get away from that situation now we're just coming up to the end actually um of, of this but i remember if you very quickly maybe a sentence or two um i just wanted to ask you like how important do you think a book like this is um for for young writers or for young working class people to hear their stories Mike, michael go ahead there. I'll, I'll go first actually yeah because i i <laughs> <laughs> I didn't actually realize, um, cause I, whenever I first got the PDF for it, I only had a glance through, um, and read a couple of pieces. And then today I, weirdly today I sat down and read most of it. And like the thing that kind of struck home for me. And I think like the thing that people are very skeptical of is having writers like Roddy Doyle, Lisa, Kevin Barry. June Caldwell, uh, write about their experiences of this, regardless of the fact that they've, you know, been on a certain trajectory and they occupy a certain position within the literary world that makes it kind of uh, encouraging in a way to know that other people are talking and thinking about this or have experienced these same, similar sort of, a, have these similar sort of experiences in their life. So I think for young writers, I think that's, I think that's a good thing. It can only be a good thing. So, yeah. Great. And we're just, Lisa, just quite quick, these are coming to the end. Um, would you have an answer for that question or a thought on it? I, I, yeah, I agree with Michael. I think it's, it's all about permission and it's all about validity and feeling that your stories, your experiences and your, your perspective on things is as valuable as what you perceive to be literary stuff. Mm -hmm. so. 
Yeah. Well, listen, thank you both very much for joining us today. It's been great. Thank you to UCD for inviting us to give us a platform to come and talk, giving working class writers a platform, giving this book. And once again, it's called uh, The 32. Can you see it there? Oh, there we go. Uh, I'm just I'm just waving. I'm tempting you like this um, because I can't figure out the backwardness of the very thing. Um, but um, it's uh, an anthology coming out in July 8th. Um, you can get it, uh, pre-order it now from most bookshops. You can also go to Unbound, the publisher's website and pre-order it. Um, I, I hope you um, you do do that and uh, enjoy it. Thank you again to the UCD Festival and um, please do check out the other events there and you can join in a conversation online at hashtag UCD Festival. Uh, thank you both very much. All the best. Thank you, thank you Paul. Cheers. Thank you.